Um, so, hi everyone. Thank you for coming to my talk. Uh, as uh, mentioned, I'm Dr. Carrie Chenault, and I'm an assistant professor of geography here at CSU. Um, I'm also co-director of the CSU Prison Agriculture Lab, along with Professor Joshua Sabika. So today I'm going to talk to you about our lab's work investigating prison agriculture in the United States, um, including how we've used GIS as a way to explore and examine pr prison agriculture within its broader landscapes of inequity. So here's the plan. Um, we're going to first break down the title of the presentation into two parts. So I'll give you a brief introduction um, into prison agriculture in the U United States, and then I'll talk you briefly through racial capitalism and how it relates to prison agriculture and issues of inequity. So as we go through both of these points, I'll show you some examples from our lab's collaboration with the CSU Geospatial Centroid and our efforts to map, visualize, and understand prison agriculture within these disciplinary landscapes of racial capitalism in the US. Um, before we get started, I want to really acknowledge our collaborators at the Geospatial Centroid, including Sophia Lynn and Joshua Rayling, um, their work on the GIS map, and also uh, with Kristen Karashinsky, and I think all these people are attending today. Uh, Kristen's been leading our effort developing the Story Map Project and also our lab website. Um, and then we've also had a lot of uh, former collaborators at the Centroid as well, so I'll acknowledge them too. So um, it's been a really great partnership. So we're all thinking about Thanksgiving coming up next week, right? Like I, I cannot wait. Um, it'll be good to have a holiday. And I'm sure many of you will be heading to the grocery store uh, to pick up some items, right? Um, lots of chickens will be sold in the next week. Maybe you'll grab some eggs for baking. Um, if you're like me and you're from the South, you'll use those eggs when you're making your cornbread dressing. If you're not from the South and don't know what that is, don't worry about it or ask me. Um, but maybe you're picking up some apples for apple pie or making some mashed potatoes next week. Um, or maybe you're a pescatarian and planning to broil some tilapia or trout. But, uh, you know, when we're buying food at the grocery store, um, maybe some of the time we're actually thinking about where that food comes from, or maybe we never think about it. It's actually really hard uh, in many cases to know what you're buying, uh, maybe beyond like a sticker on that apple that shows it was grown in the USA. Um, but beyond that, we really don't have a lot of insight into what goes into the food that we're buying. So today I'm going to talk about one source that you may not have considered, and that's prison labor and its relationship to food and agriculture in the United States. So here's a, a, a did you know. Did you know that um, there are actually incarcerated people in at least 660 state operated prisons in the US who are involved in agri-food work or programs? Um, so this actually, this figure comes from our data at the CSU Prison Agriculture Lab. We did a massive uh, nationwide data collection effort where we contacted all of the prisons, uh, spoke with officials and also used archival methods, examining state government publications and documentation of prison agriculture. Um, once we developed our initial data set of the prisons themselves, we classified all of the activities at prisons into four main categories based on the type of agricultural or food work or programs. And we assessed the reasons why prisons engaged in agriculture. And we grouped those into themes that we called purposes. So I'll talk more about this in a minute. Um, very briefly though, the four categories are uh, horticulture and landscaping, crops and civil culture. So those are like production crops. We'll get into that like it could be corn, soybeans, cotton. Um, so animal agriculture. And then finally food processing and production. Um, and an important part of our data collection effort has been linking our data set to a federal geospatial mapping of the prison property boundaries. So you can actually uh, go in uh, on the GIS map and, and see the actual borders of the prison boundaries. And you can even sometimes see gardens or, um, you know, plots where 
corn is being grown. And so um, that's been a really, those two data sets together have been an important building block upon which we started our collaboration with the geospatial centroid. Um, and so let's see, I'll quickly move on. So when I say prison agriculture, some of you may not have ever thought about this and, and you may not know exactly what I mean. So what do I mean when I say prison agriculture? So our project, we're specifically talking about people who are incarcerated in prison, who are assigned to work or assigned to some form of labor on prison farms. Um, so maybe they're growing cash crops or maybe they're raising livestock from state to state. Maybe their labor is actually leased out through a contract to a private agricultural or food corporation. Um, we also have programs. So maybe they're growing vegetables in a prison garden as part of a vocational or educational program. And you can see some examples on this slide. Um, and the products of this agriculture are being used for a variety of purposes. Often it's being used to feed incarcerated individuals at the prisons um, and often uh, in other places, the produce is being grown and donated to a local food pantry. Um, and in many cases, as I said, at the beginning of the presentation, the food actually ends up on the shelves in your grocery store. And this is particularly the case with these contract leasing arrangements. Um, so long story short, uh, we found a lot of variation from state to state and region to region across the United States. So prison agriculture has a lot of diversity, both in the types and in the activities, um, as well as the reasons why state governments choose to engage in these sort of operations. Um, one thing that's consistent that we did find across the country with prison agriculture and really any type of work or program in prisons is that the incarcerated people uh, really aren't paid much at all, maybe a few cents an hour if they're paid anything. So they're working definitely below minimum wage, often for nothing at all. And with some of the educational programs, uh, say in horticulture, uh, the incarcerated people are actually paying tuition to be part of these programs. So even when these programs are considered voluntary, um, in many states, it's only voluntary in the sense that they're choosing to do agriculture instead of some other work or some other program. So um, it's, it's not really fully voluntary in that sense. And of course, this is GIS day. I'm going to share a few screen captures from our GIS map and our story map. Uh, you see our story map here. Um, our websites for these aren't live yet. We're still in development. So I'll just show a few preliminary uh, screenshots here. Um, we should have both of these applications released within the next few months. Um, this image here is from our story map and it shows prison agriculture across the United States. So this is the data set we collected that I just spoke about. And you can see the four colors of dots representing the four categories of agriculture. So yellow represents horticulture and landscaping. Um, and often we're talking about growing fruits and vegetables there. Uh, and that's definitely our most common category across the country. But you also see animal agriculture, which is in purple. Uh, and that's raising things like cattle or maybe even doing aquaculture uh, like we saw on the first slide. Um, and that happens right here. Aquaculture actually happens right here in Colorado prisons among other places in the country. Uh, there's also crops and silviculture in blue. So we're talking about field crops like corn, cotton, rice, et cetera, as well as hay crops and silvicultural crops. And then food processing and production, which you see in green, actually represents the lowest number among all four categories. Um, if you remember back to the first slide, I actually, uh, one of, with all of the food, I showed the workers in the Tyson chicken plant. That, that was one of the images. And so that's an example of where prison laborers are leased out to Tyson uh, chicken. Uh, so that's one example of food processing and production. And I think it's probably our most undercounted category because it's really hard to get documentation and to trace these various labor contracts that are happening inside of prisons. Um, and of course, today's talk is about mapping justice. And it may be pretty evident to most of you why prison labor in food and agriculture is a justice issue. But I'll talk briefly about how we frame this in our research, uh, which informs our approach to GIS. 
So I want to introduce a term here, uh, which may be new to some of you. Um, it's a term called racial capitalism. And I'll briefly discuss what racial capitalism is and why it matters for mapping spatial inequities in prison agriculture. So um, racial capitalism is basically the idea that our system of capitalism here in the United States, as well as elsewhere in the world, depends on racial hierarchies and racial inequity. In other words, capitalism as we know it today would not have been able to function and exist without marginalizing racialized people uh, and doing so in order to create economic value. So that's basically racial capitalism in a nutshell. Um, so with that definition in mind, I wanted to show another part of our ArcGIS story map. So this is a screen capture of our timeline. And we have an interactive timeline where users can go in and look at different key moments in US history that uh, shaped racial capitalism as well as prison agriculture. So this entry on the timeline um, shows a period of uh, chattel enslavement in the US from 1619 to 1865. And our timeline shows a range of events more broadly in the US and in the prison system that really lead up to the, this current status of prison agriculture and prison agricultural labor today. Um, so to make this point about racial capitalism, uh, in our research, we look very closely at the 13th Amendment of the US Constitution and what it meant in terms of slavery. And some of you might be thinking, well, didn't the 13th Amendment actually end slavery? Uh, well, the answer is both yes and no. And the no part of that is very relevant to prison agriculture. So we also, in our story map, we, talk, we show the text of the 13th Amendment um, and discuss, it discusses how both slavery and involuntary servitude are abolished by the 13th Amendment, except as a punishment for a crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted. So that's a, the precise language. And, and what does that exception mean? Well, it basically means that people who are convicted of crimes, people who are service, uh, serving sentences in prison, they aren't subject to the 13th Amendment abolition of slavery and involuntary servitude. So that one exception in the 13th Amendment really sets the stage for what happened next in US prisons, uh, both in the South, but also across the entire country. And so um, on that timeline, we next show the year 1901 and um, but two farms, Parchman Farm, which is today known as the Mississippi State Penitentiary, and Angola Farm, which today is known as Louisiana State Penitentiary. And these are actually um, plantations that were then turned into prisons. And so if you actually go onto our ArcGIS map, you can look at each of these prisons across the country. Like here I show Louisiana State Penitentiary and you can see what's going on today. And so we see that this place, which was once a plantation with slaves and then a prison farm, it's still actually a prison farm today. The prisoners there, they um, engage in a horticultural program. They also work as laborers growing crops and they raise livestock. Um, and then we also show the purposes um, on this map. So you can look at how the state government actually justifies this work. And we see that agriculture fulfills work requirements, meaning that the state requires incarcerated people to work. Uh, ag also provides cost savings to the state. It provides food for feeding incarcerated individuals. And we see that some of the produce crops or livestock are also sold for revenue generation. Um, so finally, the state of Louisiana justifies these activities as a type of vocational training. Um, so basically, that means that the state says that this type of work will prepare incarcerated people for jobs after their sentence is up. And so regarding racial capitalism, we are really interested in these things like revenue generation, where the state is using prison labor to make money uh, while also not paying the laborers uh, much of anything. But we're also interested in the types of jobs that prisons are preparing people to enter. And so we ask the critical question, why is it that people who are incarcerated are seen as deserving this type of work, this type of job, this type of labor that's really on the bottom of our social hierarchy of capitalism in the US? Uh, so these aren't jobs that if they enter into that they'll actually have a very stable life or be able to support themselves or their families very easily. And of course, these tend to be dangerous jobs. 
And just with the last five minutes, so we also can look at Mississippi State Penitentiary and see pretty much the same thing. It looks a lot like Louisiana. And so the story maps I've just presented seem to paint a clear narrative. Um, we see like this historical association between prison agriculture and the US South. Um, but, and there's certainly a history to back that up, but using GIS, one of, the, one of the things that we're looking into is how to show people that prison agriculture and the structures of racial capitalism that undergird it aren't just located in the US South. This is pervasive across the entire country. And though the types of activities might look a little different from place to place, it is this racialized notion of deservingness for certain types of jobs, for certain types of labor that really unifies all this diversity in prison agriculture across the country. And uh, we see prison agriculture in every single state in the country. And of course, the East is more densely populated and places like Texas have more prisons than other states, as well as more prison agriculture. But nonetheless, we found 660 state prisons, which is what you see represented here uh, in all 50 states with some form of agriculture. And in our story map, uh, GIS story map, we provide several case studies that make this point. Um, in the last couple minutes that we have, uh, I have to talk, I'll show you here uh, from Colorado. So this is really a case study that looks at Colorado Correctional Industries, which is a hybrid for-profit entity that's part state corrections and part private enterprise. And the laborers in Colorado Correctional Industry are the people who are incarcerated in Colorado state prisons. Um, so here's another screenshot from our story map. And you may recall that uh, the fish that you saw on that first slide when I talked about that Thanksgiving grocery list. Well, those fish are being produced in a Colorado correctional industry fish farm. Um, here's a page from our story map, which shows one of the infographics produced by CCI, along with the video that users can watch. And it really describes the situation in Colorado with prison laborers uh, raising tilapia. And previously, in the, uh, until there was a lot of uh, controversy, this tilapia was sold at Whole Foods all across the state. Um, and so then you can scroll down on the story map and read other stories about these protests around prison labor. And we have numerous other case studies in the story map. And the final point I'll make today, uh, just to show you one other feature of our GIS map about racial capitalism and its relationship to prison agriculture. We also look at what we call ethno-racial overrepresentation data. So we look at, these are the achloropleth of the counties with state prisons in the United States. And you can look at the overrepresentation of black people and of Latinx people uh, in relationship to prisons and also look at that and layer in prison agriculture. Um, and so all that is to say is that we cannot understand agriculture in prisons without looking at the disproportionate incarceration of people of, of color that occurs across the entire country. And I'll conclude today with saying that this is just a very, very small glimpse of some of our GIS map and story map projects. The ArcGIS map is actually bringing in a huge amount of data about the surrounding landscapes of prison agriculture, including biophysical crop data, economic data, uh, agricultural production, socioeconomic data, demographics, and more. And I'll end the presentation today by saying thank you all for coming. And I look forward to talking with you more about prison agriculture and mapping justice. And I want to once again thank all of the collaborators who've made this work possible.